Good evening, and welcome to tonight's John A. Widso Foundation Virtual Conversation, Church History and the World, Temple Worship. I'm Richard E. Turley, Jr., your host for this evening, and I want to welcome our two guests, Jennifer Mackley and Richard Bennett, two scholars who are longtime friends of mine and well-known to many of you through their writings. I will introduce them more fully in a few moments. Before doing that, I want to mention next month's Church History and the World Conversation, which will focus on the March 1839 Liberty Jail Letter, from which we have gotten three sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, sections 121, 122, and 123. That conversation will take place on Sunday, October the 10th, and our guests for the evening will be David W. Grua, historian and documentary editor for the Joseph Smith Papers, and Stephen S. Davis, a noted Missouri trial lawyer and longtime student of Joseph Smith's Missouri years. That should be a fascinating conversation, and we invite you to join us for that occasion. I also want to remind you that previous conversations in this series are available at the John A. Witso Foundation website, www.witsofoundation.org. And now before we get started, I want to remind you of the format for these conversations. We will begin this evening with a discussion between our guests and me. I will pose questions to them to initiate the conversation and move it along. Meanwhile, we invite you as audience members to craft your own questions, which we'll begin addressing about half or two thirds of the way through the hour. You should be able to submit your questions to us on whatever software program you are using to view this conversation. Now let me introduce you to our guests for this evening. Jennifer Ann Mackley is the executive director of the Wilford Woodruff Papers Foundation, which she co-founded with Donald W. Perry in 2020. Her intense study of the life and writings of Wilford Woodruff began 25 years ago after hearing the account of his experiences in the St. George Temple. In 2014, Jennifer published a book, Wilfred Woodruff's Witness, The Development of Temple Doctrine, to share her research about the pivotal role in the development of temple doctrine in the 19th century that Wilfred Woodruff had. It is that book that interests us for this evening's discussion. Richard E. Bennett, along with his wife, Patricia Dyer Bennett, is currently serving as site director of the Mormon Trail Center at Historic Winter Quarters in Omaha, Nebraska. He spent much of his career as a professor of church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University, from which he retired last December. If you've followed his books and numerous articles over the years, you will understand why he fits so well at the Trail Center in Omaha. But it's one of his most recent books that is of particular interest to us this evening. In 2019, he published Temples Rising, a Heritage of Sacrifice, which reflects his years of studying temple worship in the church. Welcome, Jennifer and Dick. Thank you. Because uh, you're broadcasting from different locations, I'm gonna direct my questions to you individually, and then you should each feel free to chip in at any time to add your comments to whatever the other person says. So let's start with Dick. Dick, you've studied church history. You know about the commandment to go to the Ohio to be endowed with power from on high and then the subsequent construction of the Nauvoo Temple. What were some of the differences in the ordinances between the Kirtland and Nauvoo Temples? Well, in many ways, the Kirtland Temple ordinances are what they called the Holy Endowment were preparatory to the higher endowment of the Nauvoo Temple. But that's not to say that it did not have enormous spiritual impact upon the saints. The endowment of Kirtland was threefold. There was the washing, there was the anointing, and there was the washing of the feet. And this triple combination, if you will, of rituals and ordinances was accompanied by, if we are to believe the journalists at least, a wonderful outpouring of the spirit. They were remarkable in their impact, especially upon the new missionary force 
that the church was sending forth at that time. You can't really see the Kirtland Temple without it being the launching pad for great missionary work. That becomes so important to the early church, but it was strictly for men and the ordinances were strictly for the living, which is fundamentally different than what you see in Nauvoo, where those ordinances will be raised a caliber or two to include women and to include work for the dead. So the Kirtland Temple, yes, it was preparatory, but it was foundational to the work that's going to develop in Nauvoo Temple in the few years thereafter. Thank you. So Jennifer, the Nauvoo Temple introduces things like you know, baptism for the dead, which of course is done in the river before the temple is completed, and other ordinances. What, what was the law of adoption? And what, you know, when, did it, when was it introduced? What was its purpose? And when did it end? The law of adoption was the idea that because the priesthood had been taken from the earth during the apostasy and it had been restored through Joseph Smith, that to connect the family of God from those in the church in the 1830s and 40s back to Adam through those priesthood lines and back to God meant that there had to be a connection. There had to be a link. And what the leaders of the church understood changed through time. The introduction of the idea of, of binding us to our fathers, or, or at least our hearts turning to our fathers, was, a, I think the importance of that is underscored by the fact that it was part of the first uh, divine instruction that Joseph Smith received after his first vision. And to have that connection understood took 21 years for Joseph Smith, but um, between 1823 and 1844, the understanding of sealing uh, progressed and changed and became fundamental to everything we do in the church now. But as Brother Bennett was saying, the introduction of those first ordinances in Kirtland became a critical part of that step-by-step -step understanding because the, the sealing that occurred in Kirtland was simply the sealing of the, the blessings, a, a priesthood blessing or uh, an ordinance where the, the sealing in Nauvoo became the sealing of a covenant, the marriage covenant, and then the sealing of individuals to each other. So if you had um, someone, and there were many who joined the church and maybe their spouse didn't, or maybe they were disowned by their family when they when they became members of the church, or maybe they had um, joined with family members or a spouse, but they hadn't remained faithful. So the idea was that the sealing would not occur to your biological parent, but to a priesthood leader. And again, the idea was we were all part of the family of God and therefore connecting into that priesthood lineage meant that you're part of the family of God. The idea of the, the word of adoption comes from, uh, we're, we're adopted into the house of Israel when we're baptized into the church, um, we're adopted into the kingdom of God. And so that is the same idea that through sealings to priesthood leaders into the priesthood lineage of those leaders, then you have the same blessings and the same connections. So it began in 1846 and it ended uh, when Wilfred Woodruff received revelation in 1894. Okay, thank you. Dick, comment on how the law of adoption was a schoolmaster in the development of post Nauvoo temple work and tell us a little bit about the Exodus era and temple work. That, that's sort of your, I think, best known area of expertise is uh, the crossing of the plains. Could you put all that together? Well, just to add to how Jennifer has so beautifully described 
practice development of the law of adoption, Brigham Young called it a schoolmaster. They did not fully understand the doctrine of redemption for the dead in 1844. I think bottom line in all of our discussion here is that temple work is a, is a doctrine in process or in development. To think that it all came out of the oven as a fully decorated cake is not to understand temple work. It's a, it's a, it's a doctrine in progression and in progression of revelation and understanding. What he meant by that is that we had to be sealed to the priesthood in one way or another, not knowing that the gospel was being necessarily taught to the dead, as we read in section 138 of the Doctrine and Covenants today, which wasn't given to the church until 1918. A full comprehension of that doctrine of the dead was not there. But it's going to go from line upon line and precept upon precept. They knew they had to be sealed to the priesthood, but if their own ancestors, had rejected or their family had rejected the gospel, how could they be sealed to them? And so they had to figure out what you might call it almost a shortcut or some other way of trying to be sealed to where there would be safety and security in their salvation. Hence the law of adoption, which even Brigham Young said we did not fully understand. And so that became, as he said, a schoolmaster. It really flourished in winter quarters. You'll see that in the diaries of those who were here, how important that was to be concerned, connected with their families through adoption. And that much of the exodus occurs in terms of adopted spiritual families moving west together. That will later change with uh, Wilfred Woodruff, especially with the introduction of endowments for the dead, which signaled, it's the right word, signaled the demise of the law of adoption, because in the future we're going to be sealed to those who have received their endowments, and that includes the dead. Whether or not they had accepted the gospel, or if we thought they would ever accept the gospel. And so you see that in this trial of the Exodus, there is continuing formation of an understanding of the plan of salvation. The work that must go on is very, very important to understand the uh, significance of wilderness temple ordinances here at Winter Quarters along the trail in early Salt Lake in the council house and in the endowment house and later in the St. George Temple, which becomes so important to the church. Maybe we'll talk about that as we move on. Thank you. Jennifer, you've spent a great part of your life studying Wilfred Woodruff, and so know a great deal about him. Why was Wilfred Woodruff baptized nine times? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, he was baptized as an infant in his parents' church, uh, along with his brother. And they later studied together uh, the scriptures to try to understand where Christ's church was to study other religions and those in their community to to find the church of Jesus Christ on the earth and followed very strictly the the New Testament principles so when Wilfred Woodruff um, got a little bit older he decided that even though he couldn't find the church that Christ was similar to what Christ had taught he should be baptized by immersion rather than sprinkled as he was as a baby and so he sought out a local minister and asked to be baptized by immersion. Um, that was in 1831. And then in 1833, when Zara Pulsifer and Elijah Cheney um, arrived at his house, he recognized that not only was it the gospel of Jesus Christ that he'd been looking for, but that they had the proper authority to baptize him. And so he was baptized in that case a third time, this time by immersion with the proper authority. And then when he, um, along with those in Nauvoo, they went through the Reformation in Nauvoo, they were rebaptized at that point. And it was um, to signify, um, I mean, it was a, re a remission of sins, but also a renewal of their covenants. When he 
uh, joined the pioneer camp and they arrived in the Salt Lake Valley in 1847. The entire camp was rebaptized again. And then um, at that time in church history, it was um, rebaptism was also used for health and healing. And when on those occasions, it was again a remission of sins, a renewal of covenants, and a restoration of health. And the, that language was actually in in the ceremony. Um, so it was for those reasons, as well as those uh, re-entering the temple or um, joining the United Order in their specific community. And then uh, there was a, another reformation in the 1850s and then a uh, third reformation in the 1870s. So he was baptized a final time in 1875 along with all of the Quorum of the Twelve. Um, again, it was a symbol of renewal and uh, public showing of commitment, but also for remission of sins. Thank you. Dick, before 1877 and the dedication of the St. George Temple, if you had received your full endowment in the sense of not the Kirtland endowment, but what, what was offered in Nauvoo and in the council house and the endowment house, how did you remember the covenants that you'd made in the temple? Well, that's where they kept good journals and good memories and everything else so that they're trying to remember it as well as they could. Obviously, those things were such sacred um, importance that they didn't talk too much about those things. But you can see why it was that on January the 11th, 1877, with the introduction of endowments for the dead, what that meant to the saints and why that was of such enormous significance. It was really partly Wilfred Woodruff's great temple uh, work and his dedication to temple work under the direction of Brigham Young that this is going to happen. So instead of just being endowed once and for all, now you're coming back to the temple over and over and over again. It becomes that school, that university, if you will, of gospel learning that had such an enormous impact upon the saints. And not only those who were alive, but of course for the dead. And it opens up the vistas of temple work in such a way that we had never seen before. Women serving in many capacities in the temple that they never served in before. Because there's salvation for both the women and the men. And this whole doctrine of endowments for the dead, which Again, as I said in St. George, yes, Rick, helps them now to remember very, very well their covenants and ordinances. But it's also going to be a great service, as many said, being saviors on Mount Zion for those who had passed before. And you can see now that the endowment implies priesthood power. And if you're doing that for the dead, it implies that somehow they must be being taught the gospel, therefore. And they must be receiving priesthood authority. And we can be sealed to them like we never were before. And so this transformation in temple work uh, is, again, a, trans, a progressive movement. And what happened in St. George on the 11th of January, 1877, should be emblazoned on the annals of the church somewhere i think we need a monument don't you think jennifer we should have a monument to wilford Woodruff someplace don't you think uh the father of temple work i've got to be a little careful of that brigham young knew very very well what joseph smith had taught about temple work but they're moving together in this direction to uh bring all things to their remembrance which uh, that might be the way to put it shall we I think too, it's important to understand that if if temple work had remained as Joseph Smith administered it, it would look completely different than what we we do now, in part because although he understood what was supposed to happen, he didn't live long enough to seal one child to their parent, to seal one family together, to administer any of those ordinances in, in a temple. And it was only three months before he died that he 
he shared what he understood was the mission of Elijah. And that was to go and seal yourselves to your fathers and your mothers and, and to those beyond the veil. But that was a statement. And then his death three months later changed everything. So yes, it was Brigham Young who he asked to continue that. But even Brigham Young um, but lived only long enough. Um, he died eight months after the, the St. George Temple was dedicated. So even then, those, those ordinances that were administered under his watch, it was Wilfred Woodruff who, who was pivotal in moving those things forward, but also the, the understanding that, that had been gained over those 40 years and, and was able to then carry it forward and why he was so critical in making the changes that occurred in the 1890s. So many of those ordinances had been suspended for decades and then some were even discontinued and, and, and it was under Wilfred Woodruff's care and through revelation, but it was his understanding. He was the one that had the one thread that carried through all of those changes and, and the process that had occurred. If I could just add to that, Jennifer, Wilfred Woodruff loved the prophet Joseph, as you well know. And Joseph did perform proxy baptisms in the Mississippi River and did have an understanding at the beginning of the doctrine of, of, of salvation for the dead. Uh, and others talked about how the prophet Joseph had that vision, but exactly how it was to be applied. I think we're going to leave it, like you say, to Wilford Woodruff, and Brigham, and others, that eventually is going to be built upon the foundation which the prophet Joseph had laid. I think today, in many ways, we take temple worship for granted. We make a reservation at our local temple. We go there with family names if we have them, and if not, the temple supplies names to us. And we're able to go through the various ordinances, particularly the endowment again and again and again to help cement in our minds the covenants we make at that time. Uh, as, as Dick mentioned, the St. George Temple led to a marvelous change in the way temple worship was carried out. If you were endowed earlier than the St. George Temple, you were endowed once and for all and might not ever have a chance to go through the ceremony again. So Jennifer, you've studied Wilfred Woodruff and the St. George Temple. This, this transformation, this transition that Dick talked about, can you just sort of detail it for us? How did it go from the very beginning of the temple over the next several months to get us to sort of where we are today and being able to have church members go in and do work not only for their own ancestors, but for others? I do think, as, as Dick said, that the importance of the St. George Temple is often overlooked, and it was the foundation of modern temple worship for many reasons, but part of it was, um, as you said, the those who had been endowed in Nauvoo were the only ones that were hearing those words and those ceremonies and those promises and blessings through 31 years, from 1846 to 1877, and that was part of the impetus to build a temple uh, with the Saint Salt Lake Temple taking so long to construct. And so St. George became that place. And just like Joseph Smith had felt an urgency to share um, his understanding and the keys with others, Brigham Young felt the same. And so it was, he went down with Wilfred Woodruff in November of 1876, and they had constructed the basement just like in Nauvoo and, and the, the baptismal font had been installed, but there was much work left to do. So they worked together uh, November, December to January to prepare um, a ceiling room and an area for endowments. And then the, the final um, dedication was in connection with that April's conference. So between January and April, they would meet in the temple, uh, they would perform those ordinances um, the first proxy endowments, the first proxy ordinations to the priesthood, the baptisms for the dead, and the sealings. And then they would meet at night, uh, and it was a group of them, Brigham Young, Wilfred Woodruff, um, Brigham Young Jr., and also John D.T. McAllister and um, L. John Nuttall. And they would go over the ceremonies. They were writing them down for the first time. But it was also a new... Um, 
layout or a new configuration. And the idea that um, it was not just trying to uh, work with as many as possible with the living, but to do the proxy work as well. So it was understanding just as it had gone from the red brick store to the Nobu Temple through the endowment house and the council house in Salt Lake, this was a new opportunity and, a, and an adjustment. So part of it was adjusting to the change in who the ordinances were being done for, but also the um, ensuring that they were uniform and consistent, that those who were uh, had been trained to administer the ordinances in Nauvoo now had that opportunity and new people were being brought in. Lucy Bigelow Young, uh, one of Brigham Young's wives was the matron of the temple. Wilfred Woodruff was there without his family at the beginning. And so that was the major push at the, uh, between January, February and March, but also the idea that Wilfred Woodruff had gone there, had spent decades doing the research on his own family lines, his wife's family, his um, mother, his stepmother, and he had over 3,000 names. And with the changes that had occurred in um, who could perform ordinances, for example, in Nauvoo, it had been men and women performing for men and women. And now it, with the understanding that you start with baptism and endowment and sealing, it, women would perform all those ordinances for women and men for men. So he went to the Lord and, and said, how can I do this? How can I possibly do 3000 men and women? And the answer was, you don't have to do it by yourself. We can help each other in these ordinances. That was the first big change was um, that we could actually work on other people's lines. And as Brother Bennett mentioned, there were women there who had been to the temple, but had never thought they'd be able to go back. So they had received their own endowment, but the opportunity to serve again and to do so if, if they didn't have any genealogy, if they didn't know anyone in their family, then they could still go back to the temple and, and serve for others. So that was the first big change. And the second big change is, is the, the famous uh, experience that Wilford Woodruff had with the founding fathers. And in his words, he said, I'd been so focused on my own family, I hadn't even thought that there were many people out there. And, and he made a list of eminent men and women, about 170 total, and, and to expand temple work even further. So um, not just focus on, on his own family, but all those who, again, at that point, they were still focused on those they felt worthy to um, receive the gospel or thought that there would be a chance that they would. And then the third part was the idea that um, it was uh, a shared responsibility, a shared opportunity, but also there at this point there was still adoptions. So there were 13,000 adoptions um, and that ordinance had been suspended between uh, the Nabu Temple until the St. George Temple. And so that was reinstituted and and the focus again was to make sure that everyone had a connection. And the question has come up before, um, why Wilfred Woodruff? And it wasn't because he was the president of the church, but every one of these um, revelations, these personal revelations to him were things that were then, he talked to President Young about, and it was supported in the, in the global sense that it wasn't just a special thing that Wilfred Woodruff could do, but it was something that opened up temple work to everyone. Thank you. Brother Bennett, we've talked about the St. George Temple and most church members have heard of the Kirtland Temple and the Nauvoo Temple and the St. George Temple and the Salt Lake Temple, but many of them don't know anything about the work you mentioned while crossing the plains or about work in Salt Lake from 1848 to 1893 with the dedication of the Salt Lake Temple. Can you talk a little bit about that period for us? Yes, and happily so. The uh, Exodus period, to go back to that, was a time of great development in temple work. Here at Winter Quarters, Nebraska, which was then a territory, as you know, back in the 1840s, was a place where temple work of a kind did occur. Brigham Young 
if I can use this phrase, listen to God with one ear, but listen to his people with the other. There are a great many people coming here that had never been to the Nauvoo Temple. As you recall, the Nauvoo Temple is only open for a very short time for temple work, or at least, shall we say, for endowment work. In late 1845 and early 1846, many missionaries came from their missions, not in time to receive those blessings in the Nauvoo Temple. So here they come, thousands really coming here to winter quarters, and some of them pleading with the prophet leader of the church, who then was president of the council of the 12, but titular head of the church, asking for the blessing of sealing, especially spousal sealing, women to men, and in the hopes that they could receive that blessing, Brigham Young, knowing that he had the key, the priesthood keys, bent to their wishes. And here in winter quarters, just down the hill from where we sit tonight, uh, there were approximately 154 marriage ceilings performed in winter quarters, most of which were in Willard Richards' octagon, or which they called the potato heap for nothing better. It must not have been the most beautiful place to look at, but it was one of the larger cabins. They also had a council house where they had special blessings. There were no endowments for the living or the dead performed in winter quarters, but there were ceilings. You can imagine how satisfying a blessing that was to the saints, many of whom were dying here at winter quarters. We have right across the street here at uh, the Mormon Pioneer Cemetery where some 400 Latter-day Saints are buried. And across the river in Council Bluffs and on the Iowa side, another maybe 15, 1600. This area was a valley forge of Mormonism when so many were giving up everything, sacrificing for the church and pleading with Brigham Young, can you do this? My wife, my husband is on deathbed. And he listened and blessed them with these kinds of blessings. Wilford Woodruff himself baptized for the dead in the Missouri River. Not many, but some. He was always a little step ahead in terms of his understanding of how temple work will unfold, like Jennifer was saying. Along the way on the Mormon Trail, not well known is the fact that Many times they would stop the wagons and have a ceiling out in the middle of nowhere behind some bluff somewhere. We see that at Chimney Rock and at Scott's Bluff and along the way. So uh, temple work goes with the saints. You don't leave it behind and then rediscover it later on. It's a doctrine in progression and an understanding unfolded. Now to the question of what happened in Salt Lake, shortly after the founding of Salt Lake in 1847, Brigham Young and the Twelve established the Council House, which is Kitty Corner, Kitty Corner from the Joseph Smith Memorial Building in Salt Lake City today. And in the Council House, they performed endowments and ceilings. It was a two-story affair. The ground floor was for territorial business. It was a library. It was also the first University of Deseret. It was all for temporal affairs. But on the second floor, they dedicated that for temple worship. So the line between church and state was rather thin, Rick, at that time. <laughs> Upstairs, was holiness and downstairs was business. And for approximately five years from 1849 to 1854, the council house was a pro tem, shall we call it that, temple. Then in 1855 with the construction of the endowment house, which is on the, what would be today, the Northwest corner of Temple Square, the endowment house, a two-story adobe building, had a baptismal font, 
and had various rooms and you would go from upstairs to downstairs in a sense of progression as we do in some of our temples today. And maybe 140,000 endowments were performed there between 1855 and 1889. Many, many baptisms for the dead, sealings performed in the endowment house, but never an endowment for the dead. It was as if they were waiting to complete a temple that that higher ordinance, if we can call it that, would be introduced to the church. And it wasn't until 1877, down in St. George, where those first endowments for the dead would be performed. But that council house and that endowment house were very sacred blessings to the early saints and sacred blessings. Now, they did not just reserve ceilings for those buildings. The brother would also go out into the communities to Provo, to Fillmore, to Logan, wherever the saints were congregating and perform ceilings in many places in the territory, uh, which made a very huge impression upon the saints. It was a matter of the temple coming to the people, not just a temple blessing, shall I put it that way? coming to the people and not just the people coming somewhere to the temple in a time when they were so busy trying to establish a living in a very difficult frontier that once again, Brigham Young and his counselors and members of the 12 taking those blessings of the temple to his people, which is one of the reasons why he was so endeared by them. Brigham Young was not what you call a, a warm and fuzzy person. He loved Brigham Young from a distance. He, he, he had a certain personality that not everybody agreed with, but he did listen to his people and they loved him for that. And so you see this continuing progression in, in temple understanding and temple consciousness amongst the saints. We need to get to questions from our listeners, but before we do, Jennifer, would you just talk briefly about the dedication of the Salt Lake Temple, the revelation about law of adoption, and the creation of the Genealogical Society of Utah? Sure. The temple in Salt Lake was dedicated in April of 1893, and the revelation ending the law of adoption was received in April of 1894. And um, that same month was the uh, founding of the genealogical, what became the Family History Department of the Church, but was the Genealogical Society of Utah. And those were all part of um, this development that had gone on since 1823. Again, um, to, briefly to say what Joseph Smith, what was introduced to him in 1823 by Moroni, required 71 years to put into place. And it wasn't because the saints didn't follow the revelation they received, it was because they did. And when they did, um, they would take a step and go back to the Lord with additional questions and receive additional revelation. And it took the introduction of Elijah's mission, um, then the restoration of the priesthood. And it was by Peter, James, and John who had been on the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah. And then um, the restoration of those keys um, by Elijah in 1836, and then the implementation of those things that were possible. There weren't multi-generations in the church in Nauvoo. There wasn't the ability to seal those children to their parents and grandparents because that hadn't, we didn't have those people in the church yet. So in addition to the priesthood itself, the power to seal and the ordinances, it was also, we needed generations of people in the church and then the buildings, the sacred places to perform those ordinances. So by 1893, we had the St. George Temple, the Logan Temple, the Manti Temple, and then the Salt Lake Temple. And that was when Wilfred Woodruff went back to the Lord and said again, you know, we progressed this far and we have multiple, multiple generations on the earth. And we now have multiple generations on the other side of the veil who have received th these ordinances of baptism and endowment um, and an ordination by proxy. So now it was time to 
um, end the law of adoption, that interim ordinance, and begin sealing biologically. And it, at that point, there had been 13,000 ad adoptions into priesthood lineage. And it, people could um, cancel those, but it was kind of a, a double guarantee. So um, most of them didn't. Um, but that was that was the the development that occurred over those 71 years to make it possible to then be able to seal beyond the veil to those who had received all the necessary ordinances. Thank you. We've got a lot of questions that have come in both to the question and answer portion of the site and also the chat portion. So I'm going to bounce around a little bit here and I'm going to direct the first question to Brother Bennett. There's a question about the temple work on Ensign Peak. And I, let me just sort of preface that by saying Addison Pratt and companions had been sent as missionaries by Joseph Smith to Hawaii from Nauvoo and therefore went east to the Atlantic, took a ship down south around the Horn of Africa and headed up towards Hawaii and then ended up in uh, Addison Pratt in Tupuai, what becomes French Polynesia. So he missed the Nauvoo Endowment. So Brother Bennett, can you talk to us about Ensign Peak and any temple work that was done there? Uh, yes, we know that there was at least one endowment performed, outdoor endowment on Ensign Peak uh, for Addison Pratt before he goes on his mission to the South Seas. And it raises the question, well, what, does the con what really constitutes the endowment? And above all, it represented in that covenant. It may, have, may not have all the dramatization and everything else, but it represented that covenant that was so essential. In fact, many of the uh, endowments that were performed in the council house were to missionaries about to embark on their missions. In fact, the very last one to receive his endowment in the council house, and I think it was 18. 53 or 54 was none other than Joseph F. Smith, who was also going on a mission to the South Pacific, not the South Pacific, but to Hawaii. And that was as a send-off to go on their missions. And if you remember, we started talking about how Kirtland was for early missionaries to prepare them through those various holy ordinances to go on that mission. So you see that same thing that's happening in Utah, or Utah Territory, shall we say, in 1849, because Addison Pratt was anxious to go. They had not yet finished the council house. And so, again, there's a very interesting pragmatic side of this spiritual equation that if we have to make some changes, we can do that. We have the keys. We can make adaptations as required. And that's how I look upon Ensign Peak as a time and a place of making that kind of adaptation to fulfill the needs of the church and of the members themselves. Thank you very much. So Addison goes on his first mission, comes back, gets endowed, so he can go on his second mission. As you say, we, we have that tradition from Kirtland of preparing missionaries for a mission through the endowment of uh, power from on high and then later the full endowment, uh, a tradition that of course, continues to this day where we like to have missionaries in doubt as much as possible before they go on their missions. Jennifer, we have a question from someone who asks, where can you go to look up the specific place your family member was endowed and sealed? Well, it depends on when they were endowed and sealed. <laughs> um, the, uh, the church has the records um, that contain uh, the, the books from Nauvoo, um, also the books from St. George. In the early church, the journals were also an important record. So for example, Wilfred Woodruff's journals, um, he felt were an official record and the point of a journal was not to keep a travel log or a, a question and answer for yourself, but it was an official record of God's dealing with his children. So those dealings included every priesthood ordinance, um, baptisms, confirmations, ordinations, blessings. And if you go to wilfordwoodruffpapers.org, 
and one of your relatives were, uh, for example, baptized in Great Britain in the 1840s or the Southern states in the 1830s, you'll find that in Wilfred Woodruff's records. So um, if it's something that um, was repeated, um, endowments are available, uh, baptisms are available, not all ceilings are available. So there are uh, special, um, I'm not sure what the exact name is, but um, the special room at the um, Church History Library that the ceiling records are available as well. And that's all the way back to the first ceilings in the 1840s. Thank you. Dick, we have a question. What was going on in the endowment house before the dedication of the St. George Temple? You've answered that in, in part. Um, I, I think it might be interesting to talk about, because there's some other questions that get to this point, about the length of the endowment during that time period. Well, in the uh, endowment house, which as I said, also served as a temple pro tem, in Salt Lake City between 1855 and 1889, when it was raised or taken down by order of the United States government, actually, that it'd be raised and taken down, that it was used as a place for endowments uh, for the living and baptisms for the dead and ceilings. Now that endowment was, could be quite lengthy. Uh, it could last maybe three or four hours. One of the reasons they maintained the endowment house, even after the St. George Temple had been constructed in 1877, was that it was so far away. To go from Salt Lake all the way down to St. George was no small undertaking, especially for a young couple who wanted to be sealed in the temple. And so for that period of time, with a few years accepted, the endowment house was very popular especially in Northern Utah, uh, especially for young couples. But as I said earlier, there were many, several thousand ordinances performed in that sacred building uh, that lasted until 1889. The council house being preparatory to that by about five years. Thank you. There's a question, Jennifer, from someone who says, was the ceiling also a way, they're talking here about law of adoption, was it also the way to connect and create a church family? And then the person goes on to say, the interceding between all of the leadership of the church, like Isaac Morley sealed as the eldest son of Joseph Smith, making of a gospel family. Can you say something about that? So initially there was there was a lot of interconnection and I look more, um, I don't know, the, the initial ceilings looked more like a spider web than a genealogy chart. And part of it was because, I mean, if, if today, if a woman um, looked around her ward or stake and thought, who is, is my best chance of of making it to the celestial kingdom. Which of these men could I count on to stay faithful for the rest of their lives? Um, you're gonna go for the, for the best one there. Um, and so many chose a leader of the church like Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or Heber C. Kimball, but it was also who was present. So later in the St. George Temple or the Manti Temple or Logan Temple, it might be the temple president. And so sometimes it was that practical who was present and other times it was um, more of a family organization. So with a lot of adoption, especially in Winford Quarters, um, there, were, there was only one, um, help me out here, Brother Bennett, um, who was the one that was sealed in Nauvoo, man to man. You mean to? To Joseph Smith. Son to father? From, to Joseph Smith. Well, there were many, many that were sealed to Joseph Smith along the way. There were some yeah, I can't remember the name of the first one. But so, so for them, it was um, not just 
the connection to the priesthood, but it was as a family, which is why uh, in winter quarters, they no longer performed the ordinance, but they continued to, to talk as families. And so Wilfred Woodruff, for example, gathered about 150 people together and said, although you're not officially adopted to me in that sense, we're gonna operate as a family. We're gonna have family rules and we're gonna organize together as we cross the plains. And that lasted even in, in the organization in Salt Lake, the settlements in Salt Lake. And so those, those connections as, as church families were real, even if it wasn't through uh, an official ordinance. And then there was also lists of those who hoped to be adopted into certain families. So it was a practical um, organization of the church as well as spiritual connection. And, and people did it for different reasons. Thank you. There's a member of our audience who is reminiscing about the time when we had the old mission home. Um, the last one, the old last old mission home in Salt Lake was at the old Lafayette School across from the church office building, but it was in various locations before that. And in those days when there was a mission home in Salt Lake City, the missionaries in preparation for their mission not only were able to experience the endowment, but they also went to the temple assembly room and had instruction there, making for what this per person calls a very full day. Brother Bennett, do you want to say anything about that period of, of our history? You're going to date me, Rick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I went through that, so I'll put myself in no, the same I same went point. through that in that Lafayette <laughs> school, wherever they called it there. It was a week-long intensive MTC. I'll never forget it. It, uh, it it almost killed me before I left. But it was a wonderful experience. And yes, we did go to the temple, I think a couple of times, as I recall. And on the fifth floor of the temple, and Rick, you know this better than anybody, uh, where we had what we'd call almost mini solemn assemblies almost, and uh, talks with Harold B. Lee and many of the 12, I was, and we were set apart by the 12, myself, I was set apart by Johnny, not Johnny Woodso, but um, um, S. Stillworth Young uh, on my mission. And so, yes, uh, again, we have that pattern though, of before you go on a mission, you're gonna be prepared in temple doctrine and in, and in temple worship, because the temple is all about covenants and holiness to the Lord and righteousness and uh, becoming a better, holier person, just as it was back in Kirtland. And that's something perhaps we should have mentioned a bit more, that it wasn't just the endowment itself that was so significant to the saints. It was the preparation for that endowment. Then looking forward to that endowment, where they purify themselves, where they abstain from certain practices, where they went through a refiner's fire to prepare for that mission or prepare for that uh, new assignment that they were going to, to, to go on. So that in many ways, the endowment was a, was a, um, a benediction to the way that they had prepared themselves. It isn't just a bunch of ordinances and rituals. It had everything to do with how you live and how you were expected to live. I think I began to see that when I was going through in that MTC about, hey, you can't fake this. Uh, you're going to be making covenants, but it's the preparation for that endowment that is as, almost as much as an endowment as the thing itself. And I think that was an understanding of the early saints, which gave them such commitment to it, because it wasn't just to a ritual, it was to a way of life and to a newness of life that uh, makes it have such traction even to this day. You make a very good point there. I think oftentimes people may make very little preparation for an experience like that. And you sort of, you sort of get what you pay for if you're, if you're really dedicated to understanding it and dedicated to living it, then you're gonna get far more out of it than if, it, if you treat it superficially. Jennifer, you mentioned the recording of the ordinances, the language of the ordinances that first took place in 1877 in the St. George Temple. We have a member of the audience who asked the question, how similar is the current ceremony to the one performed in the red brick store, uh, which is sort of getting at the question of how, as Brother Bennett said, the endowment changes over time because um, the, there are certain 
components of it that really represent the endowment. Much of the rest of it is just the vehicle for teaching us about the endowment. You want to talk further about, about that to the extent that we can outside the temple? So the, the important parts that we understand that the covenants that we make, the idea of what the endowment represents hasn't changed. And as, as Brother Bennett was alluding to, in Kirtland and especially in Kirtland, it was the physical parts. It was, it was following Exodus 29 and 30. It was the sons of Aaron being brought to the temple. It was those physical rituals that um, preparing to behold the face of God. And Joseph Smith had had that experience in mortality, and he hoped that every member of the church would be able to, to have that, that incredible uh, experience that were promised to behold the face of God. And, and to use Wilford Woodruff as an example, which I always do. <laughs> um, so the solemn assembly that was held in Kirtland twice was, was going to be an annual event, and it was to be that beholding the face of God, what happened at the initial dedication of the Kirtland Temple, um, Christ's appearance, um, the appearance of Moses, Elias, and Elijah, all of those incredible experiences. So when Wilfred Woodruff arrived there, he prepared himself for that very thing, and they did prepare themselves physically. It was fasting and prayer and cleansing, um, washings, anointings, um, the gifts of the spirit, all of those things. And so when he was there for the Solemn Assembly in 1837, it was to prepare himself and to prepare themselves to behold the face of God. And at the end of that experience, Christ did not appear. And I wondered, as I read his journal, if he would be disappointed, but he wasn't. Instead, he was thrilled to write and, uh, about the experience. And he said he beheld the face of God, the countenance of God in those around him. And I think that's why the temple experience is so important um, to be experienced as a group. It's not a text that we study, like we study the scriptures. It's an experience. And part of that experience is that covenant making, but there's a, a presentation of that that goes along with it. We change our clothes and we, we separate ourselves from the world and we we go there to um, learn together, to, to when two or more are gathered in his name, his spirit will be there. I mean, all of those things come into play. So the changes that have occurred, and um, I went through every one of them and listed them by year. And, um, you know, even, I mean, through my lifetime, it's been incredible changes, but they're to the presentation of the endowment, um, whether it's the length of it, um, the, the things that have been removed, um, the language that is used to explain it. Um, and, and that's significant to many people. The covenants haven't changed. The promises that we make haven't changed since Joseph Smith. So when you talk about the length of the endowment in Nauvoo, it got longer and longer because afterwards they they sit together, they dance, they you know play music, um, eat. Um, so the length didn't matter. Um, as far as the change from four hours to an hour and a half, those things didn't change the covenants that were made. The um, physical nature of it um, has changed more to symbolic. And yet the idea is the same. We're preparing to behold the face of God, not necessarily at the end of each temple session, but at some point in our lives, we will all behold the face of God. And the temple is designed to prepare us for that. And to, like Brother Bennett said, it's not a one a once in a lifetime experience or a ceremony, it's a way of life. We're out of time. I'm just going to sort of combine a couple of questions and answer it quickly myself. And then I'm going to ask uh, Jennifer and then Dick if they wanna have any concluding remarks before I, I sign us off. Uh, there are a couple of questions about prayer circles, particularly prayer circle rooms in buildings in Utah or in Idaho and other places. I'll simply say that in the, particularly in the days before there were opportunities to go through the endowment multiple times, people recall the covenants that they made by participating in prayer circles outside of temples. Uh, that's all I have time to say about that right now. So Jennifer, do you have any last words you'd like to say? <laughs> 
I would just encourage um, anyone, if, if you do have questions that weren't answered today, um, feel free to, to reach out. Um, and if you go to josephsmithpapers.org, if you go to wilfordwoodruffpapers.org, there's an incredible body of, of work on, on just these topics. And if you can learn anything from Wilfred Woodruff, it is to have a perfect brightness of hope. Um, beyond all of these things, it is that hope and eternal life. And that's what the temple is all about. Thank you. Brother Bennett? And going back to Moroni and the prophet Joseph and Joseph Smith History 154, it says that in each of their interviews, he gave me instruction and intelligence about what the Lord was going to do and how and in what manner to conduct his kingdom in the last days. And I think you see that the temple work. We want to thank our two guests this evening, Richard Bennett and Jennifer Mackley for spending time with us. We remind you again of next month's conversation, Church History and the World, Liberty Jail Letter featuring David W. Grua and Stephen S. Davis. Finally, we invite you to revisit tonight's conversation and previous ones by accessing the John A. Witzel Foundation website, www.witzelfoundation.org. Thank you for listening and good night. <laughs>